Hello, BookTube. Recently, Karen at KD Books did a video on his channel that was wonderful. I will leave a link to it down below. It was the top 10 classics you must, in capital letters, read. And it was energetic and interesting. It was a little odd, as so many of his videos are. He is one of my many arch nemeses on BookTube. <laughs> He's never quite got over the scalding burn of his loss in Has Steve Read It. <laughs> but he goes over a list of ten classics, and I don't know if it's a guy thing or a bookish thing or a YouTube thing, but I can't resist a list. <laughs> I just can't resist them. So I watched and loved just thinking about the thought processes that went into his list. Now, for his list, he stipulated... These are things written before the year 1900. And he also admits that uh, he hasn't read every classic. And I would be willing to bet that the classics on his list that were not originally written in English, he has never read except in translation. So there are, there are limitations. This is mainly an, an effusively passionate personal response to the canon. And I thought we'd go through his list of ten, but of course I want to give a list of ten of my own. Of course I do. So his first choice was Oedipus Rex by Sophocles, uh, which is understandable. Is it is widely regarded, was regarded in the ancient world as a literally perfect play. Structurally, everything. Just that it was as tightly controlled and perfect a play as you could get. He also suggests that if you want to get a little bit ambitious, you could read Electra as well. And I would agree with that. Neither one is going to take you very long to do, and there is a plentitude of translations. And then he went on. He moved from uh, Sophocles to Dante. <laughs> so he covered, he covered 1,500 years in one gigantic jump, and he recommends Dante's Inferno. He doesn't mention a translator, but he does mention that uh, it's just the Inferno that he's thinking of, not the Divine Comedy, not the Purgatorio and the Paradiso, the just Inferno. Because of how surreal it is, I think probably in a weird way, because of how accessible it is, it's a series of increasingly outlandish and garish tortures of the damned. Now, he, Kieran makes a point in his video that, that after you leave Inferno, the Commedia becomes more and more, just asymptotically more complicated and difficult to understand. I think that's true, but I think a lot of people underestimate how complicated Inferno is. It, it's easy to concentrate on the tortures, on the garishness of Dante's imagination, and sort of gloss over a lot of what else is going on in that book. But in an English translation, very much worth your time. Unlike, for instance, the next item on his list, which was the play Everyman. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, the, this was, this was a, an immensely popular work of literature. It had a prose version. It had a, a million knockoffs. It had a million editions and pastiches. And they're all, for a 21st century audience, mind-numbingly boring. They're religious allegory. There's a reason why that has fallen out of favor and is not written anymore. <laughs> what it's doing on a top 10 list, I don't have any idea. But there's like a, a football stadium full of authors who lived between Sophocles and Dante that are raising their hands all at the same time saying, you skipped right over us and you're including every man? <laughs> you want to read it, you'll never find a more passionate advocacy than his channel. Then he moves on to uh, Dr. Faustus by uh, Christopher Marlowe. And that's an interesting choice. It's not, if I put Marlowe on such a list as this, that wouldn't be my choice. I would probably put Tamerlane on my, on my list instead. You're absolutely not allowed anymore. The, the Taliban religious police, the cancelers, the censors that we have given power amongst us will cancel you completely. They'll make it so that you don't have a job. No one's related to you or knows you has a job. If you recommend The Jew of Malta by Marlowe for this list, can't be staged anymore, can't be talked about anymore, can't be written about anymore, except with five pages of prefatory apology. But even if you leave that out, I would still put the first part of Tamburlaine ahead of uh, Dr. Faustus. But getting to Marlowe forces Kieran to talk about Shakespeare he doesn't like. 
I'm even getting those words out. He doesn't like Shakespeare. Right around the time when he started being outspoken about his dislike of Shakespeare as an author. We're not talking about a, a gimmick here or a gimmick there, a play here, a play there. He doesn't like Shakespeare as an author. And right around the time that he started being outspoken about that, his hair started falling out. Coincidence? <laughs> we'll leave you to judge. But he grudgingly includes Shakespeare on his list and says that if it's going to be Shakespeare... He makes it sound like it's the worst imposition in the world. Then maybe one of what he calls the big three, Hamlet, Macbeth, or Romeo and Juliet. Hard to argue with, with that. Then he goes on uh, to Paradise Lost by John Milton and praises it, and that's great. It mentions how incredibly cerebral it is, how complicated it is, that's true. Uh, the impression you would get from his video is that he considers Paradise Lost to be more complicated than Dante. It isn't. <laughs> but, but it might on the surface seem that way. He makes a comment. I won't, uh, we're, we're brothers, so I won't, I won't jump all over his comment. But he makes a comment along the lines of, if anyone online tells you that they've read Paradise Lost and understand it, they're lying to you. Um... And uh, that's not actually true. <laughs> that's not actually true. It is possible to read and understand Paradise Lost, especially if you've read it a hundred times and taught it. <laughs> but, but I understand what he probably meant by that was that it's really complicated and that people might think if they only understand the surface of what's going on, you know, the temptation of Adam and Eve, the war in heaven, uh, the expulsion of Satan, then they probably get it. There's a lot more going on than that, even on a line-by-line -line basis of the the pro the the verse but it, it isn't an incomprehensible work of literature i don't know i don't know where that comes from and then we have uh the next thing on his list was an all too comprehensible work of literature the sorrows of young Werther, uh by goethe who's a, a, a kieran refers to it as the sort of the fawns at origo the the or the origin the fountain of romanticism and it's pretty clear that romanticism whether it's English or European, has him by the heart. <laughs> it seems, it's pretty clear that underneath that very rough exterior, <laughs> there, is a, there is a softy, um, someone who's, who loves the romantics. That's neat to see. Uh, once again, I, would, I might quibble with uh, the choice. Top 10 classics that you must read, keep in mind, is the, is the, uh, the title here. Every man does not fall under that category. And I would argue, if you're saying 10 and must, that Young Werther doesn't fall in that category either. Maybe Faust by Goethe, but not. But it's on his list, and he mentions that it was, once upon a time, the absolute favorite of Europe. It, it swept the reading world in a way that you have to read to believe, which is kind of kind of amazing. But not, not quite as amazing as the next item on his list, which, keep in mind, remember, is the top ten classics you must, in caps, read. The next item on his list is The Castle of Otranto by Walpole. What on earth? What on earth? <laughs> I can only assume that a Horace Walpole has incriminating Polaroids of KD books. I can, that's the only reason I can think of why his book is on this list is something that you must, in capital letters, read. <laughs> when, when Virgil is not on this list, the commentaries of Julius Caesar are not on this list, Boccaccio is not on this list, but the, the Castle of Otranto is on this list. Uh, I'm not saying that it's a completely worthless thing to read, uh, but the, if you asked me, I have two books that I'm thinking of next. Both are canonical. One is The Castle of Otranto. I'd be hard-pressed to think of a second book that wouldn't get my billing first, if you asked me. But it's on his list. The next one that he lists is Mary Shelley, the 1818 version of Frankenstein. He mentions it as a kind of uh, prototypical science fiction novel. I always think, I mean, I've seen that done many times before. People sort of calling this a prototypical science fiction novel. I, I really think that's unfair. I really do. I really think if we're going to start handing out accolades to, to authors for having inaugurated a genre, we should hand out auth accolades to authors who knew what they were doing. Mary Shelley wouldn't have any idea what you were talking about and would deny it if you explained it to her. I, I would much, be, I'd be much more comfortable giving it to H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, or even 
you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs, but um, certainly the 1818 edition of Frankenstein is well worth your time to read. It is essentially one enormous gasp. <laughs> and it's, it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And then the last item that he includes is Crime and Punishment. The last item on his list is Crime and Punishment, which is, you know, a fairly safe uh, candidate. The, uh, the cover that he shows is the Peviar and Volkonsky translation, which is a really good one, a really, really interesting one to do. And uh, there's also the Michael Katz translation. If you felt like getting that one online, the Michael Katz translation is also quite good, quite cacophonous, quite headlong and has a, quite the cover blurb. <laughs> For all time, that volume will have a cover blurb on it. But that was that was his list. The Castle of Otranto and others. <laughs> He's an odd booktuber. That's why we love him. <laughs> I thought I would make a uh, responding list. This is not in any way meant to be a competition, and it's not in any way meant to be a correction either. There's a lifetime of satisfying reading to be derived from the ten books that he lists. But I thought I would list 10 others. Now, at, periods, at different periods in his video, he mentions that one of his criteria is long-standing influence. The shadow cast by the book, as we used to talk about on my Western Canon starter kit. Uh, it, that varies all over the place in his video. It's not always the case. You'd be tough. It would be tough to make that case for the Castle of Otranto or every man. But at other times, he's talking about he mentions that these are the ones that he likes the most, and his video ends up being a kind of very effective combination of those two elements, those two metrics. So I thought I'd do the same thing. And so my number one to start with is the Pentateuch, <laughs> which is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And you might think, well, I don't need to read all of those, right? And that's a slog. But sometimes, re when we're talking about influence, if we're talking about the influence side of the criterion, so not deeply passionate love, although I love these these books, I could read, I've read them more times than I can count. If we're talking about two sides of the criteria, one being your favorites, the other being the most influential, there are no more influential pieces of literature in human history than these five parts, books, whatever you want to call them, of the Pentateuch. Of, there's nothing more influential here. You only have to read them through from start to finish to realize that no matter where you are in the world, no matter what culture you're in, you are suddenly reading, maybe for the first time, where a lot of that culture came from, good and bad, mostly bad. <laughs> it's, it's a thing that most people skate right over. But the, the moral, the ethical, the legal underpinnings of so much of what you deal with in your normal day are born in these books. Genesis is an amazing thrill ride. The Exodus is also a bit of an amazing thrill ride. As you know, even if you haven't tried reading these, after Exodus, the what we would call the narrative energy of the, of the reading experience drops off quite, quite a bit. There are parts of the rest of these that are clearly meant to be consulted by experts and judges and community leaders, rabbis, rather than read as any kind of narrative experience, it does form a kind of narrative experience. This is a, this text has been gone over more often than any text in history. It's, it's definitely number one on my list. I would put it there for both its intrinsic interest and also its definite effect. Oh my God. And then, unlike Karen, I'm going to stick around in the ancient world for just a bit. Instead of catapulting 1,500 years forward, I'm going to mention another work that is extremely well known. It is a household name. And if you haven't read it, if you've only read about it, if you've only heard about it, you really should read it. it, it it's been translated a million different times, so any translation, you will, be, you will be bound to find a translation that works for you. And it's Homer's Odyssey. Uh, this is the Palmer translation, but really any translation will do. just depends on what kind of book snags your fancy. <laughs> and this is, of course, the story of Odysseus making his way back home from the Trojan War. But the fact that I could even say that, that this is the story of that, so quickly and so concisely, is important, because I can't say that with Iliad. This introduces a kind of narrative framework introduced here in the, in the accidental sense, in the sense that a lot of the other narrative frameworks don't survive. 
but it introduces something, a kind of hero's journey narrative superstructure that talk about influential. It, it, a lot comes back to this book. And it's also really entertaining. It's, it's really entertaining to read. The only bar for most people will be finding the right translation. And the key there is right for you. Don't listen to anybody saying, putting their nose in the air and saying, well, this translation is better than that one. Some translations are very objectively bad. But if they work for you, start with them. You can always move on later to something else. And there are plenty that are objectively good. It, don't, ever, don't ever let someone put their nose in the air and say, well, I prefer this translation. And if you didn't read that, you're not really reading the work. Nonsense. The key here with a with thousands of year old work of literature that's alien in every way except its entertainment value is that you get along with it enough to read it from start to finish. And for that, you need a translator you get along with. So find a translator that works for you. Don't worry about their, their P's and Q's until later. We can talk about it later. Then this next one, most of you are also going to need a translation of this as well. It is also from the ancient world, a lot later, but still. And it is a, an utterly remarkable work. The more you read in ancient, in ancient literature, which we, will, we can take from being around the time of Sophocles to around the time of this author, so about a thousand years. This is at the end of that time. And the more you read of ancient literature in that thousand-year time period, the more you see how stand-out weird this book is. It's the Confessions of St. Augustine. And faith manuals, that's what this is. It's basically a, a personal faith manual were common in this time. They were common before this. They were explosively common after this. But Augustine does it in a way that no one else does. Mixing in not only heaping amounts of his own autobiography, but large amounts of what we would nowadays consider to be psychological vulnerability. It, it's a universal reaction to this book when I hand it to somebody. I give them a little preparation in terms of history, a little preparation in terms of who St. Augustine was and what this book is, so they don't go in completely blind. But I don't tell them any more than that, and I don't put my thumb on the scale. It has been the universal reaction of people when I have done that. To be caught up in this book and have, when they're finished, the feeling that they have read something contemporary. Even in English language translation, that definitely comes through. This feels like it is so honest and bare and beautiful that it comes off as a contemporary document. And that's amazing. It's amazing to, to read it and remind yourself that the whole world has changed a hundred times since this was written. Uh, then we'll move, we'll move forward again, but not quite so far forward as, as our beloved Katie books. We'll move to this, Beowulf. Uh, much like every man, <laughs> this is anonymous. And in, once it became widely known to the public, enormously influential as a high fantasy story, it pretty much gave birth, I would say, it, it and one other source gave birth to what we consider to be fantasy as a genre at all. And uh, it's had many translations, and many of those translations have suffered from academies. Academics get hold of this, and they've spent their whole life quibbling over one gerund and one verse. And it shows in the translation that they do. That is not true with J.R. Tolkien, even though he did his fair share of linguistic quibbling. But nothing brings this poem alive more than Seamus Heaney's translation. Just this, this is just an absolute triumph of the translator's art. It was recognized as that the minute that it came out. It has been universally recognized as that since. I don't usually put my nose in the air. I'm not now about translations. You find a translation of Beowulf that works better for you than this, the Chickering translation or Burton Raffles, very popular translation, go to. But I don't think there's anything even remotely close to this. This is what you get if you have a really talented poet translating a really talented poet, think about it for a minute and you'll realize how incredibly rare that is. There have been a thousand translations of Catullus. No one has ever translated Catullus who had his level of poetic skill. <laughs> That's like asking too much from the gods. It'll never happen. No one, almost no one, I would argue, has ever translated Dante with anything like his omnivorous uh encyclopedic reading knowledge or the weird odd knowing bounce of his verse i it would you'd be hard pressed to find someone who could do that imagine god i don't even want to i don't even want to guess 
who would we have to do? What kind of combination would we have to find? To get a pitch-perfect translation of Dante wouldn't be Longfellow. I hate to say that, but it wouldn't be Longfellow. I think the, what you would have to do is some combination of Ogden Nash and H.L. Mencken. <laughs> Where you have... Anyway, anyway. Uh, the same thing is true here. Beowulf is in a very old, old form of English. You, If you read and speak English now, you can. if you look at that text, you won't be able to make head or toe out of it. So you do need a translation. In this particular case, I would advocate the Seamus Heaney translation. Uh, and for my, for my next one, another conspicuous omission on Karen's list, but I will include it myself, and that is The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Not Troilus and Cressid, which was a, a work of his, a towering work of verse that was conceived, composed, and finished as a whole work of art. This was not. This is famously unfinished. But uh, it makes up for it. It more than makes up for it with the intense, um, immediately identifiable humanity of the stories here. Of course, uh, you will all know if you've, if you've encountered this in school at all. This is a group of pilgrims on the road passing the time by telling stories. And it is absolutely wonderful. Just wonderful. So it had to be on the list. Now, this is also written in a kind of English that is older. It's an English that you don't use in your day-to-day -day life. But you will recognize it if you read it. You, it's easily available in an English version that is modernized. Easily. There are plenty of those. And plenty of them are really good. Neville Coghill is probably the most popular one. But there are... Uh, Burton Raffle himself did one. And there are plenty of others. But... If you look at Chaucer's original wording, it will start to make sense to you. You could, if you wanted to, dispense with any kind of transliterator or whatever and just stick with him. Uh, then this next one, I'm not saying there are any rules for this. This is not a tag. I'm not weaponizing Karen's video. But I am going to echo him at one point. You can't make a list like this. If you're going to do top ten classics and put must in capital letters... No matter what he's on about, I don't know what's going on here, who broke up with who, but Shakespeare has to be on that list, and not the way he puts it on his list, very grudgingly. Oh, I guess if you have to read No, Shakespeare is the best writer who's ever lived. <laughs> he's the greatest human writer who's ever lived. You should be, he should be enthusiastically on your list. I might be bradish enough to say all of Shakespeare should be on this list, just as one entry. You should certainly read and reread, study and savor all of Shakespeare. One piece of advice that Kieran makes in his video that's absolutely true is that you should watch these things. In addition to just reading them, you should watch them. I think in his video he sort of scandalously implies that maybe you should just watch them and not read them. I wouldn't do that. There's brilliance in in the writing. But it very much helps to watch. There are if you go on if you search around YouTube, you will find many, many examples of Shakespeare plays that you can watch. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not bastardizing it to, to suggest. But Shakespeare is, of course, going to be on my list. I'm going to suggest Hamlet, uh, which is widely regarded as his greatest play. It might not have uh, the ripping immediacy of the tragedy in something like Macbeth or Romeo and Juliet, and it might not have the God only knows what's going on in something like King Lear. But there's a reason why it is it is on every reading syllabus anywhere in the world. If you're not familiar with the play, you should read it and find out. You will immediately find out why it is on those lists. Then we'll move forward to uh, something that was, was largely missing uh, from from the list of Katie books, which is nonfiction. Uh, and we'll go to this, a Vindication of the Rights of Women by uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, which is very engaging reading. It is not a dry and boring text, uh, but it's also utterly fascinating, eloquent and impassioned. Uh, the, the author's call for the recognition that women are human beings. <laughs> so, so it's obviously relevant, even in the 21st century, two, three hundred years after it was written. But this would be very much for that eloquence and also for its it, it, eternal relevance, right? I mean, misogyny is the oldest bigotry that humans experience. It's It was with humanity before humans had fully evolved from the mother species. They, it has been around forever. It was, it was in the human species before there were any other things to be bigoted about. <laughs> so it's 
there was a huge amount, an unbelievable amount, a mountainous amount of cultural momentum that Mary Wollstonecraft was working against. And it shows in this writing. That's what makes it, it shine with brilliance. So uh, I'm going to put that on this list. Then I thought for my list, I should nod in the direction of the romantics that seem to have captured Kieran's icy heart. <laughs> he mentions the sorrows of young Werther. Okay, fine. For most of you, that's going to mean dealing with a translator. And for most of you, it's going to mean dealing with a level of inaccessibility in addition to the translation. Young Werther is a, a, a phenom. It's, it's a weird thing. It's a weird, it's at the center of a weird phenomenon. Maybe you want a more accessible, a slightly less intimidating entrance point to the Romantics. Possibly you do. If you do, in the English language, and I hear I'm sure that Katie Books would recommend this as well. He had to cut himself off at 10 books, although we'll get to that at the end. He's not stopping at those 10. Uh, I'm sure that he would agree with this point. I, it just didn't make it onto his list. And that is Lyrical Ballads uh, by Wordsworth and Coleridge. Uh, uh, absolutely seminal volume of poetry that really did kick off the Romantic movement in English and was over talk about a long shadow of influence oh my overwhelmingly influential but unlike the sorrows of young Werther, it's actually really enjoyable to, to read it's it's not a slog of, of uh, lacrimose crying in one's beer instead it's it's a uh, beautiful so uh we'll, we'll keep a, a, a nod to the romantics and put that in there and then uh, keep in mind, we're stopping at 1900. That still leaves us with plenty of room. I thought I would add a little-known novel <laughs> to my list, and that is Pride and Prejudice uh, by Jane Austen. Talk about influential, <laughs> but also talk about endlessly enjoyable. I believe, I firmly maintain, that once you are accustomed to the the arch diction, the the Jane Austen was very much writing in the in the patois of her time. Once you're accustomed to that, and it doesn't take more than a chapter to get accustomed to that, this book is every bit as inviting, as immediately human, as, for instance, several of the tales in the general prologue in the Canterbury Tales and all of the Confessions of St. Augustine. That's why it's so elemental, because you don't need... Uh, a degree to get how, how fantastic this is. Uh, so I'll, we'll, we'll include uh, Pride and Prejudice, and then we'll wrap up with another novel, uh, and that is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, by the, the eldest of the Bronte siblings. Uh, Jane Eyre is also in, immensely influential, and also in, it pulls you right in. Like Pride and Prejudice, it pulls you right in. It's immensely accessible as well. So with any of the books on this list, you will almost, if you haven't read them, you will almost certainly have read about them. And whether you realize it or not, you will be reading authors who have read these things, who have steeped themselves in it. This is a vast cultural conversation. All of these books are nodes of a vast cultural conversation that you can avail yourself of right away. I think uh, quite a few of the, lists, of the books on my list are in English, were written in English. And all the rest of them have many, many, many translations out there for you to choose from, including somewhere out there, just the right one for you, the one that works just perfectly. Uh, so there you go. That is a, another top 10 classics you must read <laughs> for me. Uh, and it, the good news or the bad news, depending on how you want to put it, is that uh, Kieran's video was the first of a triptych that he is doing. He's doing a triptych of videos. This was classics. The next 10 books that he's going to do are going to be, I think he said con modern classics and then contemporary classics, which I assume will be the 21st century. So I'm assuming that his next 10 book list will be books in the 20th century and then books from the 21st century. I can't wait. I think it's going to be fascinating. All of his videos are like uh, uh, just a, a gust of energetic fresh air so i can't wait for those videos anyway but i have a feeling that i will respond to them as well <laughs> so so i'm gonna wrap this up for now i'll leave a link to his video you're gonna love it and i will be back thank you booktube